And I'm going to be talking about uh, deep uh, natural language processing using Word2Vec and Spark. Actually, uh, more than just Spark and more than just Word2Vec, but this was the sort of got it, had to compress the, the content into a, a short snippet. OK, so I'm actually going to be talking about a bunch of different things that I hope will elucidate how Word2Vec works. Um, first of all, I'm going to mention the traditional NLP challenges, how, how you normally do NLP. Um, explain the word vector intuition, how it relates to what you probably already know from linear algebra from machine learning. Uh, then I'm going to explain the Word2Vec algorithm in, more, in, in general, in more detail. Um, I'll mention the Word2Vec extensions because this is just the starting point for what word vectors essentially, um, and then mention the applications because you've probably all seen the cute examples like man is to woman as king is to queen, but that is not particularly useful if you're actually trying to solve a business problem. So hopefully I'll, uh, I'll explain how that can, uh, can be used for feature learning and, and, and putting that into other models. And uh, then I'll do a, a quick Spark demo. Although I have to say the best implementation so far is in Jensen. I think the, the Spark uh, version needs some more work. So the emphasis of this talk is going to be on the fact that, first of all, deep learning and word vectors aren't really that new. They're just the natural progression and evolution of machine learning and, um, and NLP. And that if we actually relate these concepts to what we already know from, from other um, um, areas of machine learning and NLP, then we'll be more empowered to actually integrate them into our existing pipelines. Um, so I'll, I'll show the relationship to prior art. Um, um, and that's really what's new, because when, when Thomas Mikolov's uh, paper came out in, in 2013, it wasn't clear how that related to anything. But, but this is actually the power that you can integrate it back into what you already know. Um, then the other issue is, of course, what's new is fast training, now that we have GPUs and, and, and clusters like Spark, um, cluster frameworks like Spark, it's actually possible to train on bigger data sets, and these algorithms need a ton of data. And, um, and I'll mention how that, that this basically doesn't uh, end with these, these really simple um, uh, analogy um, examples. OK, so what are your traditional NLP challenges? <clears throat> if you look at pipelines, right, we start with cleaning up your text. And if, if it's HTML, you probably remove HTML tags. You remove some, H some boilerplate from the document. There are uh, uh, Java libraries like Boilerpipe for that. Um, then you have to detect your language, right? Because it's, it, like, like we at Nitro are, are dealing with documents in all kinds of languages. And if you're doing NLP, you cannot mix you know, your Hindi documents with your um, you know, English documents or German documents, right? So you have to do that first. And that actually is generally an NLP problem. Um, doesn't matter what kind of a classification algorithm you use, but basically it's, it's, it's already machine learning at this stage. OK, once you picked, out, picked uh, the language and you, and you just uh, filtered for a particular language like English, you have to do sentence segmentation. For English, uh, it's that, that's fairly simple. Um, then you do word segmentation. In English, again, it's really simple, right? Because you just look at, for white space. But for languages like Mandarin, that's actually not easy at all. So this is a classic example where um, uh, because Chinese doesn't have uh, spaces between words, you could uh, separate the words uh, differently. And depending on the separation, you'll have completely different meaning of, of the same sentence, right? And that's actually a big problem. So, so the, the, the word tokenization for Chinese, for example, is a probabilistic problem. It's, uh, in this case, it was a, a weighted finite state transducer, which could be really seen as a hidden mark of model, essentially. Um, uh, let's see. And then you do spell checking, right? Because th there could have been um, spelling mistakes in, in the text itself. And um, the quality of spell checking depends on the effort. Because if you do something like edit distance or noisy channel, that's only uh, based on the particular word. If you're, if you're looking at the context, then you have to do n-grams and, and HMMs and so on. Uh, then, uh, in some cases, you may want to do stemming or lemmatization. And again, depending on the complexity, you get different results. Like the Porter stemmer may be really fast, but it mixes universe with the university. Um, so, um, 
you may want to remove your, your stop words uh, you, with the help of TFIDF, do case folding, etc. Lots and lots of pre-processing, right, before you get to any interesting stuff. Um, at a higher level, right, if we think of, of, of uh, computational linguistics, we may think about morphology, for example, and, and lemmatization as being a problem of dealing with morphological features, right, such as inflectional or derivational morphology. And in English, it's actually simple. You can build, you know, finite state transducers for that, but a language like Turkish, which can be seen on the right, um, has so many different components. It's not just a simple prefix or a suffix. It's it's next to impossible to figure out what what is going on. Right? Uh, nobody, I think, achieved a good uh, good model of Turkish because it's so complicated. Um, so then you may want to look at syntax, depending depending on your problem. Right? To do part of speech tagging or or uh, grammatical parsing, et cetera, et cetera, right? But this is all busy work, right? I mean, it's interesting for computational linguists. If, you're, if I'm a computational linguist, I care about part of speech tagging, right? But if I'm just doing you know, named entity recognition or some, or some prediction, uh, this is re really just pre-processing for me, right? So at the end of the day, these were not the end goals. The end goals are things like named entity recognition, knowing that Bill is a person and Seattle is a location, or relation extraction, that Bill lives in Seattle and the action of living is related to you know, the subject of Bill and so on and so forth. Coreference resolution, I want to know that it relates to music or they re uh, relates to the neighbors. Right, because I'm trying to do, to to basically uh, get some semantics out of this analysis. Right, <clears throat> may, I may want to do pragmatics if I'm actually generating language. Right, I, I I should be able to know that I should say I'm afraid I can't, as opposed to I won't. Right, if I'm as supposed to be proper discourse. Right, so going back to this space odyssey example, I'm sorry, Dave, I I'm afraid I can't let you do that. That actually relates to open the pod bay doors, which was from the previous sentence. So again, you have to have some notion of of this continuation between of, of the semantics between one sentence and another, and um, and basically things like name, named entity recognition summarization, machine, machine translation, these are the end products, right? A, a lot of the other stuff may be interesting to computational linguists, but it's really busy work for, for me as, as, as someone who is trying to, to, to get to these end goals. And if you actually look at how much featureization is needed for different algorithms, uh, sort of the classic example is the named entity recognizer from um, Stanford Core NLP, which is actually really, really accurate, but required a lot of work to get implemented. And um, so, for example, if you look at the features for this algorithm, which uses conditional random fields um, um, as the algorithm itself, if you look at the features, it has a current word, previous word, next word, and then it has the, the uh, letter n-gram of the current word and the current part of speech tag and the surrounding part of parts of speech and the word shape, whether, for example, the letter is capitalized or not. And how are you going to figure out all these features, right, depending on this is just one step, step in the pipeline. If you have to do this kind of featureization for every problem, for every language, that's really a lot of work. So, so yeah, and you know, if it's if it's machine learning, you have to do feature engineering. If it's rule based, then you have to devise rules for every language. Right? It's a lot of work. And um, and so you know. This is definitely a lot of work. And you also need labeled data, right? Because, uh, because if it's a supervised learning algorithm, for example, then you have to have labels. So, okay, enter word vectors. They're supposed to solve a lot of problems here. Um, so word embeddings, as Adam Gibson said during his previous talk, is, is basically just a way to compress the word into a numeric vector of, of double numbers. And that vector is supposed to be short, up to three or 400 elements, and it's supposed to be dense. Unlike you know, all the sparse data in, in language, you have lots of, lots of zeros in a matrix, right? So I'll, I'll show you how to generate them in a second. Um, the two papers that were really influential in this area were by Tomasz Mikolov, who uh, I guess is at Google still. Um, he introduced word to vec uh, I highly recommend them. But um, if you look at it uh, more broadly, this is actually not a new concept. And th this is the point I'm trying to drive home, that this is not some revolutionary technology that will replace all of machine learning and NLP, you know, uh, despite all the 
you know, media attention that, that has been generated around deep learning, this is actually not new. So for example, Jeffrey Hinton introduced uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, text representations back in 1986. Uh, uh, also, th there has been uh, research about this NLP from scratch back in 2011. Um, you know, if you think about uh, word vectors that capture semantics and, and semantic and syntactic features, you know, n-grams also capture semantic and syntactic features. For example, if you look at the at, at a verb phrase, you know, that is captured in this bigram, and and there's also semantic information such as eating British food actually uh, having a very low probability. Um, so it captures semantics and cultural, even cultural factors in a simple bigram. So again, nothing new really, you know, it's not just unique to word vectors. Um, you know, again, neural nets are not new in language. Joshua Bengio had a paper back in 2003. Um, uh, uh, there was more research uh, by Colbert and Weston. This is a classic that uh, a lot of the neural embedding stuff refers to. Neural nets are a new, not a new thing. Uh, uh, Frank Rosenblatt introduced them in 1957. Representation learning is not a new thing. Jeffrey Hinton worked on it back in 1986. Recurrent neural nets were introduced in 1990. Uh, convolutional neural nets were introduced in 1980. Uh, restricted Boltzmann machines were introduced in 1986 and so on and so forth. If you're interested, this last paper actually is a good uh, literature review of the history of, of, of neural networks, but again, it's nothing new really. It goes back to the 50s in terms of the concepts themselves. And uh, Jan LeCun actually had a nice post on Facebook recently saying, you know, here is my message from the AI uh, high busting department. I've been working on convolutional neural nets in uh, face recognition since uh, 1993. So uh, th what has changed really is the computing power that we can do it faster and at a greater scale. And that's actually the, probably the most important thing because um, because uh, these algorithms uh, really benefit from a lot of data. Um, and, so, and so the fact that we can do it on GPUs and computing clusters really brings out the power. But a lot of these algorithms have been around for decades, essentially. Okay, so what, how do word vectors work, right? If we, if we think about traditional encoding in NLP, which is really sparse, is, is one hot encoding. So hotel has one in one place and zeros everywhere else, and motel has one at a different place, right? So this is a very sparse vector. It could be like millions of elements and could have one in one particular place. But there is no relationship between hotel and motel. Obviously in our minds there is a relationship between hotel and motel, but not numerically between these two vectors. So what you really want to do is to learn these real valued word vectors that are dense, that, that are low dimensional, and that capture these syntactic and semantic features, these relationships between, between the words. Um, and what would be ideal would be to basically be able to uh, relate these words in some, using some simple uh, similarity measure like cosine distance or Euclidean distance or whatever, um, and to be able to visualize them using PCA, TSNE. Uh, several people mentioned TSNE today. Um, that was uh, uh, based on this 2008 paper. As you may, as you may have seen, I actually uh, uh, put all the literature links uh, on the slide, so hopefully that'll be useful if, if you want to re uh, revisit these papers. Okay, so <clears throat> how can we relate to uh, the word vectors to something we already know? Because they're really n nothing new in, in reality. Um, you know, if you were to look at it from the perspective of matrix factorization, you can slide a window over the corpus, get some n-grams essentially, or, or, bag, or this uh, continuous bag of words, um, and count the number of times uh, the center word co-occurs with neighboring words, right? So I have a center word and I have five to 10 words to the left and to, to the right, and then I basically count how many times these things co-occur in a matrix. and. Um, and because this matrix will have high dimensionality and it'll, it'll be extremely sparse, what uh, we can do is either use sparse storage, like hash maps, not actual matrices with lots of zeros, or do, use dimensionality reduction. We could do SVD, PCA, et cetera, <clears throat> to get these dense vectors. 
Um, uh, some research actually found that SVD is really good for that. However, it's not good to have actual counts because both SVD and PCA are, are uh, uh, sensitive to scaling. So the best thing to do is actually to look at, uh, to convert this to, to a correlation matrix, and then all the numbers are between one and zero. And uh, you know, uh, if, if you want to refresh your linear algebra, basically you create two diagonal matrices and multiply it times the original covariance matrix, and that's how you get correlations, um, Pearson correlations anyway. And uh, this Coles paper that I'll uh, mention in a second, um, basically uh, uh, implemented word vectors back in 2005 based on this ma matrix factorization. So first you c uh, calculate the correlations just to sort of normalize this matrix for these co-occurrences and, and then you do SVD. So um, I'm not sure whether people are interested in SVD, but you have your um, eigenvectors um, in the matrix U and then um, another set of eigenvectors in the matrix V and eigenvalues in matrix sigma. And um, basically, if you look at uh, the relationship between um, singular value decomposition and, uh, and principal component analysis, it's, uh, it's very close because um, uh, for, for the, um, um, you know, basically if you generate SVD off of a covariance matrix, like M transpose M or MM transpose, depending in what direction you're going, then taking the, the, uh, the, vec the uh, eigenvector matrix U or the eigenvector matrix V, um, and, and for example, at the bottom, if you do MM transpose, then you, uh, then you pick your eigenvector uh, matrix U to get, uh, to get the principal components, essentially. <clears throat> so that's how you re reduce dimensionality. And this is the link to the paper. And uh, let me show you some visualizations because that's actually what seems most intuitive about this. So <clears throat> by just doing this simple uh, matrix calculation, you can actually f realize that um, the simple projection onto a two-dimensional space will uh, put all the body parts together, like wrist and ankle and whatnot, in the top left corner of this, of this uh, uh, square. And um, you know various creatures like mouse and oyster and lion are going to be at the, at the bottom left, and cities like Tokyo and Montreal are going to be on the right hand side, and so on. So basically, this simple pro projection actually shows you the word relationships, and th this is just based on counts, and the counts can be converted to correlations. So it's nothing fancy really, but it's very powerful. And if you do hierarchical clustering, you can actually see that this, uh, these relationships are really fine-grained. Like wrist is very closely related to ankle, but it has some uh, more distant relationship with some, some other body part. And um, you know the, the, this this can go on and on. So, for example, swim is related to swimmer the same way teach is related to teacher, and marry is related to bride, and pray is related to priest. So this was back in 2005. So this is not Tomasz Mikulov's word to vec. This is like basic matrix factorization, but it works the same way in reality. <clears throat> and this is just pure linear algebra, like linear algebra 101. Um, okay, but it's actually not perfect. So for example, if you look at this visualization, you will see that um, showed, um, Let's see, what would be a good example here? So taking the, the present perfect form, um, you know, maybe, maybe let's say uh, closer to the uh, bottom left than um, for, for this particular verb, than, um, than, the past, than the simple past form, but if you look at some other verb, the, the relationship is gonna be reversed. So you get the clustering between uh, but, uh, for different forms of the same verb, but they don't have the same distance in a way. So it's definitely not perfect, but it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely very appealing to see it as a pure matrix factorization. If you look at um, uh, a, a more recent paper from 2014, um, they actually look at the word to vec stuff. So at the more recent version of of word vector representation, and they relate it back to implicit matrix factorization again. 
Although uh, what's interesting is if, if you uh, uh, trans uh, transform the word to vec uh, uh, model into a matrix factorization, it's actually the factorization of the pointwise mutual information matrix, which you should know from NLP. So it's, it's, it's very nice to actually know that what has been done before is actually just as useful today. It's just a different representation of the same thing. <clears throat> and sometimes actually doing small tweaks on top of what you already had could, uh, could uh, boost your accuracy a lot or, or, or generate new results. But, <clears throat> but it's still interesting that there's this continuation and accumulation of knowledge, not just some revolutionary thing that obliterates everything else. It's actually just the natural progression. And there's another paper which relates word embeddings to uh, principal component analysis. Uh, so, so this research on matrix factorization is going on. So this is nothing really out of the ordinary. Um, but there is a problem with these matrix factorizations, right? So there is slow learning. If you have, um, if you have uh, quadratic scaling with the number of documents, that's pretty expensive, especially if you're on a cluster. That's not really a trivial cost. And the, these word relationships are fragile. So they cluster together, as I mentioned. But for example, the relationship between one past tense and another past tense can be reversed for two verbs, right? And this is not great. So it, it could be better for sure. OK, so that's where the word to vec uh, uh, model cam, uh, comes in. And, um, and it's, there are two versions of it. There is the continuous bag of words. So you basically slide a window through the document. And you have, let's say, five to 10 words to the left and to the right of the center word. And you're trying to use these words to the left and right to predict the center word. So that's the, the bag of words approach. And if you use the skip gram, then you basically are using the center word to predict the words around the center word. And the skip gram is actually more performant from an implementation point of view. Um, and, and so essentially, you're basically trying to, to uh, optimize this cost function, which is just based on the uh, summing these log probabilities <clears throat> Of, uh, of the words surrounding the center word uh, conditioned on the center word. So that's the skip, skip gram model, which is actually easier to explain. <clears throat> so that's what I mentioned. You have the continuous bag of words where you predict the center word based on the context, or you predict the context based on the center word in the case of the skip gram. I'll, um, I'll probably get to the math a little bit later, but um, let me just show you something re real quick here. So um, first, I'm going to actually start with the Gensim demo as opposed to the, the Spark demo, because unfortunately, Spark doesn't have a lot of things implemented yet, and I just didn't have the time to get to it. But everybody probably has seen this example of man is to king as woman is to queen, right? And um, I'll actually explain why this tends to work. There's, there's a very simple mathematical reason behind this. But um, you can see that queen was the top choice in terms of the, the greatest cosine similarity. But there was monarch and princess and so on as, as, as uh, runner ups. So it's, um, um, so these analogies are, are one way to, to think of word to vec. Um, um, and this is sort of a nice way to dazzle VCs and stuff, but it's not particularly useful for solving actual business problems. Um, I would say that the uh, 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 basically finding, finding similar words, and not exactly synonyms, but similar words is probably more useful. So you can find, for example, you know, if you search for iPhone, you're going to find iPad. And if you search for, I don't know, Java, you're going to find, what, what are you going to find? Let's see. Oh, that is weird. <laughs> okay, that's the actual that's the actual geographic Java. All right, that's fine. But here's but here's my favorite. What do you find if you click on USA? Anybody want to guess? Has anybody seen this demo before? Okay, check this out. This is like how how great the semantic analysis is of, is of word to vec. Trademark lawsuits. Awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> You also can do odd one out, like uh, what, what is not related here? Dinner, cereal, breakfast, and lunch. Well, cereal is not a meal type. I mean, it's a meal type, but it's not a meal per se, right? So it's going to odd one, odd, uh, odd one the cereal, right? This is actually really cute, but you have to remember that this was learned on 100 billion words, so that's not a small data set. 
um, and it really took a long time to train. But GenSim is actually really fast. It's it, it may be Python under the hood, so the Java people are probably going to cringe. But uh, but the, implement, the internal implementation was using BLAS, which is a Fortran library that's the fastest linear algebra you know, uh, system that exists. And the Python part is written in Cython, so it compiles to, uh, to machine code anyway. So this is actually really fast. And, um, um, you know, this can run on common crawl in a couple of days, probably like two days or something. It's, it's actually on a single machine, so you don't need Spark for everything. <clears throat> and uh, Gensim is a really nice library. So let's go back to the presentation. Oh, let me actually look at Spark now, because I think Spark is next, yeah. So Spark, who doesn't know about Spark? Do, do you want me to uh, sort of briefly mention what Spark is, or does everybody know? I guess you probably, got, you probably know. Okay, so, um, so Spark actually has an implementation of, um, of Word2Vec but unfortunately, that implementation is only limited to synonyms. So the only thing you can do is train the corpus and then basically find the synonym. You cannot do these analogies like man is to king is woman is to queen. You cannot do odd one out. And you also cannot just, well, you can use the word vectors directly. You can get the numeric uh, representation. So you can actually feed them into other algorithms. Um, so if you, for example, do Java, right, you basically find that the top 10 uh, you know, related concepts are servlet and applet and whatnot. Actually, um, if you think about this VNC and GCC and so on, and the scripting probably shouldn't be related, which just shows you that if you cannot control the semantics that you're getting out of it, you can get some really weird stuff. And, uh, and, and it, you know, that's actually part of the problem that if you have no control over what synonyms is generating, it may actually learn some really weird, weird stuff. Um, what would we get if we did Python? Just for the heck of it. Yeah. Okay, Monty Python, nice. Oh yeah. Circus, okay, great. The wrong Python for sure. Um, I wonder which sketch it is. The dead parrot or something? Anyway, not everybody's a, Python, a Monty Python fan, probably. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so going back to the math, right? Like, people are dazzled by this idea that man is related to king as woman is related to queen. How the hell does that work? Well, actually, it's pretty simple if you think back to, to this SVD uh, perspective and matrix factorization perspective. If it's all basic linear algebra, then these relationships should be linear, right? And there's this Microsoft research paper another paper by Tomasz Mikolov, actually, um, which basically shows that these are simple vector offsets. So if you look at this vector space at this two-dimensional two projection, um, these vectors have the same, um, basically, a, a, a particular concept um, resu results in a particular uh, two-dimensional offset of the original vector. So if you, for example, add the, uh, if you subtract the concept of man from king, then you still still have this notion of being regal, right? And then you add the concept of woman, so you get queen because it's just a it's it's just a two-dimensional offset. And this vector uh, and this paper actually shows how how this works. But essentially, if you can believe that uh, this linear algebra decomposition from the beginning um, uh, is a good representation for the intuition behind word to vec, then then simple vector offsets should actually work. And, um, and it, this is not just for, uh, for semantics. This is not just for semantics such as, you know, uh, uh, man being related to king, but it's also uh, a syntactic uh, uh, representations. So king and kings and king and, and queen and queens, for example. Um, uh, just briefly, there was another really brilliant paper which basically says, hey, this is not just 
auto magical and I have no control over this algorithm, you can actually um, uh, control what these vectors are representing. So for example, uh, if you just use the word to vec and you related Alan Turing to other things, you would get finite state and deterministic and computability. But if you wanted to relate Alan Turing to Linus Pauling and Harold Hotelling and other scientists, then you could do that because if you control the uh, uh, the uh, dependencies um, in, in your sentences, then you can basically force the model to to uh, learn different things. This is really cool because this is an unsupervised learning algorithm, so normally you would just have to deal with whatever it learns, but if you can control what it learns, then it's actually very powerful. Uh, there's this glove paper, which uh, which basically sh uh, again shows the relationship between between linear algebra and, and neural networks and, and and how it all fits together. And this paper actually shows even faster ways to learn than word to vec. Um, um, although it makes a claim that it's more accurate than word to vec, and this was disproven by these folks in Israel who said, look, if you actually compared apples to oranges, if you looked at the same window sizes and the same you know, data sets and stuff, you would actually realize that it's basically the same accuracy. You may actually have a better intuition behind your model, and it may learn faster than word to vec but it's not really super awesomely more accurate. Um, and um, let's see. OK, this is actually a really good paper because a lot of people complain about deep learning and about you know, machine learning in general that, hey, I don't know how to tweak my hyperparameters. And especially deep learning has a bazillion you know, parameters like window size and regularization and whatnot. And how do I actually figure it out? Like, what, what, How long should my word vector be? Should it be 300 elements or 5,000 elements? Like, How do you tweak that, right? And these guys basically did a. Um, um, uh, showed some results with different uh, hyperparameter settings to give you an intuition as to what the good starting values are. And this was actually done for a lot of the uh, deep learning um, algorithms. So the point is that don't complain if you haven't read the literature because they actually, the, these people are helpful. And, uh, and if you start with their settings and then tweak it based on your data set, then you, you can save yourself a lot of time. So these guys, for example, did that for word to vec which is really, really a big time saver. Um, there's paragraph to vec and doc to vec This is implemented in Jensen. Um, there was this paper by Tomasz Mikulov and Kwok Le uh, from Google. And this is actually really interesting because you can apply this notion to uh, paragraphs or to whole documents. If you do it at the word level, then you get the semantic and syntactic relationship between that word and other words. But if you do it at the document level, then you're basically going back to uh, latent semantic analysis or topic modeling. Um, but this, this is just really for feature learning. You know, this whole queen and king and man and woman example is not really useful for uh, everyday, solving everyday business problems. It's just cute, right? But it's not really useful. But if you use uh, uh, word to vec and apply it, um, apply these word vectors as features to your existing machine uh, learning and, and natural language processing models, then you can deal with morphological problems. There was a paper about that. There was, of course, this super famous paper by Richard Socher from last year about doing a uh, very complex sentiment analysis uh, that had several conflicting sentiments in one sentence and still getting the overall sentiment correctly. Um, uh, there were papers about parsing. Um, uh, semantics and even reasoning. So, so this this can be applied essentially to any uh, NLP problem, and uh, to machine translation as well. I was hoping that I would be able to, to show the math, but because I'm out of time, you can actually look through the math. It's basically just very simple calculus that derives how this uh, hierarchical softmax works. Um, uh, it's it's really simple actually. Um, unlike a lot of the machine learning algorithms that are really hard to understand. <clears throat> so just to recap, um, word vectors and deep learning aren't anything new. They're just a natural progression. Um, understanding relationships to prior art actually helps you reuse word, uh, these word vectors in all your NLP problems that you've been already dealing with and just plug it into your existing systems. And the real world use cases run the gamut of you know, sentiment analysis, um, the named entity recognition, machine translation, and so on. So they're useful basically all over the place. Um, thank you. And I hope I still have time for questions, or do I not?
Okay, all right, sorry. So uh, catch me after, I guess.